Ayn had always, since childhood, been stronger and smarter than most of the people around her, which is great in certain respects and very lonely in other respects. I knew a great deal about her. I'd known her for 19 years and saw her constantly during those years. But I learned a lot about Ayn Rand researching the book. When you spend two and a half years learning about someone, if you don't learn new things about them, you're not doing your job properly. Um, I spoke to over 200 people who had known her from the time she was uh, a child in Russia up until the present time of the book. One of the, th the things I learned that I hadn't known was that her certainty about herself had always existed. Uh, I talked to people who knew her when she had just come from Russia, and she was talking then, when she barely spoke English, about writing a great novel, and she was totally convinced that she would do it, that she would know how to do it. People were not <laughs> listened with a grain of salt, to say the least, but she always knew what she wanted to do, always was determined to do it, and always was convinced that she could do it. Uh, she was remarkable in that sense. I've, I never saw any, any self-doubt in her, any doubt of her own powers, of her own ability. Uh, so I can't say this was something new. What I learned is that she had always been that way, um, not just during the years I knew her. Um, I also learned some things I hadn't known, or at least known, not, not fully known, that there were a lot of fears in her life, uh, that which she didn't talk about, because she wasn't proud of the mind, would never have been proud of, of anything that frightened her. But there were a lot of fears. Uh, for instance, she would never consider traveling to Europe, because by Russian law, she was still a Russian citizen. And she was terrified that the Russians would kidnap her and bring her, take her back to Russia that they would know she was an anti-communist. Uh, she had a, a fear of germs. She would almost boil dishes when she washed them. That was certainly understandable. In Russia, if you weren't afraid of germs, you didn't understand the situation. So I discovered both strengths and weaknesses in her, and it was a fascinating process. She was a brilliant teacher. Uh, and that's apparent in a lot of her lectures and, and certainly in her conversations. She had an ability to know, to, to sense somehow what her listeners needed to know uh, in order to grasp something. And she, she was a wonderful, wonderful teacher, especially the early days of knowing her when I brought her all the questions of adolescence that had been troubling me. Is, is there free will? Uh, things of that nature. What, what's moral? How do we know what's good and what's bad? And it was just so wonderful to have her start talking and to have those questions and those doubts just fall away because of the sheer logic of her presentation. Uh, and I don't mean I just sat and accepted it all. We would discuss, argue. But I felt like she's answering questions that I've been looking for answers for. Nobody has given me any sort of answer until now. I would bring her some of my textbooks, and I was studying philosophy, and I would read something in a, of, of a philosopher that didn't make sense to me, but I couldn't quite name what's wrong with it. Why, why is it not right? If I was really stumped, I would bring the problem to her, and the problem would fall away in 10 minutes. But that mind, that, the, the joy of watching that mind at work was something I've never experienced before or since, and I never expect to. It was an aesthetic pleasure to watch that mind at work, as well as a, a pleasure in the sense of the ideas that she held and, and promulgated. But it was a, a work of art, to, to the, the functioning of that mind. And I never got over being thrilled by it. Even sometimes when it was directed against me, I'd still be aware of what a brilliant presentation of what's wrong with me. <laughs> Well, he represents, in a way, he represents Ayn Rand. Because most of her life was spent defending ability. 
Most of John Galt's life was spent defending ability, which is why he organized the strike in the first place. So that in that respect, John Galt is Ayn Rand. Um, her books were the equivalent of his strike in that they were intended to say to the world, you had better start recognizing human beings of ability or you're not going to have a world left. That was Galt's message and that was Ayn's message from, from We the Living On. I hadn't thought of it in these terms before you asked the question, but yes, John Galt was Ayn Rand. My, my favorite section of the book had a very strong impact on, on me. Uh, it's a scene, Reardon is in his office and he's thinking back on his life and how he reached the stage of success he now enjoys. And he's thinking of, and he, he's, he's at a point where he's worn out fighting. And he's slumped across his desk, feeling like he simply doesn't have the power to, he's not gonna be able to move again. He's just tired and sick and disgusted with the, the impediments that have been put in his way. And he's thinking about the stages by which he got to his present success the nights, the weeks, the months of working, of keeping at it no matter what. And then he thinks, what was the motive power for my rise? What made it possible? And then Ayn writes, then with the greatest strength of his life, he slowly lifted himself off the desk and sat up straight and began working again. Uh, the motive power was his determination. And that rang all sorts of bells for me. It was very personally meaningful, and, and I will never forget that. Mm -hmm.